Good evening and welcome to you all on this, the sixth day of Christmas. Christmas is 12 days in the Christian church. And, uh, and so tonight is the sixth night of Christmas, also New Year's Eve. Uh, thanks for being with us. We rescheduled this service. Uh, originally, we were going to do it on the 23rd, uh, but we're happy we could still do it tonight. Let's give a little bit of a different service tonight as it's going to be a little more educational, a little more uh, informational, but also edifying at the same time as we learn about some of the favorite Christmas carols that we love to sing every year. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit more about why they say what they say, who wrote them, all of those things. Uh, so that's what we're doing this evening. We begin with the opening hymn, hymn 133. We sing verses 1 and 2. <laughs> Jesus' humble birth and sing his praises. 
Jesus was a human child for our sakes. He humbled himself and was born as a baby to save us. St. Paul reminds us of Jesus' great humility when he says, Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus, the Lord and creator of all, was not ashamed to be a baby. He was not ashamed to take on our many sins, failures, and burdens. He was not ashamed to die on a cross for us. So great is his love for us, his sinful human creatures. This tender Christmas hymn reminds us of this truth. It's a cradle song, a lullaby, where we can imagine the Virgin Mary rocking little Jesus to sleep. The hymn was first published in 1885 in Philadelphia in a German Lutheran American hymn book, Little Children's Book for Schools and Families. The author is unknown to us, although the hymn has been attributed to Martin Luther, the great reformer of the church. It is possible that Luther composed some original German version of the hymn, but there just isn't any evidence to prove it. The more likely answer is that the German Lutherans of Pennsylvania in their great admiration of Luther, ascribed to him authorship of the hymn, calling it Luther's Cradle Hymn, even though it may just have been a common folk hymn that they all knew and loved. There are three tunes to which one can sing this hymn. There is Mueller, which is probably the most popular, the most well-known and used. There is Cradle Song, which is the tune that's in our hymn book that we're going to sing in a minute. And then there's also Afton, an English folk tune that is sometimes used as well. And so we join together in singing this beloved hymn, Away in a Manger. <laughs> sing all year round, it is considered by the Danish people to be their favorite Christmas hymn. The origin of this hymn is actually unknown to us. It first appeared in a German hymn book from Munster in the year 1662. There is a legend that German crusaders sang this hymn on their way to the Holy Land during the period of the Crusades, but there's just no way of knowing whether this is true or not. Whatever the case, it has become a beloved Christmas hymn to the Danes. Daily er Jorden is the title in Danish. The English translation of We Sing and Love was done by Joseph Seiss, a German Moravian American born in Maryland in 1823. As we look at the text, we see that it reminds us of who Jesus is. 
that he is both true God and true man in the same person. Along with God, his Father, Jesus is the creator, the one who is fairer than all things in the universe. He is brighter than the stars of heaven. He is born to save us, his fallen creatures, and is deserving of all praise and honor. The tune is originally from southern Germany, but it is known far and wide. Believe it or not, it actually appears in the opening music of the well-known Disney movie Frozen. Not that that's important for you to know, but it does say something to us about this hymn's place in our culture. Whether people acknowledge it or not, Christianity is the cradle of Western civilization. Even the most ardent atheist and secularist in our society must acknowledge, even if only begrudgingly so, that he lives in a world that was built by Christian people who worship Jesus as their beautiful Savior. Glory and honor, praise, adoration, now and forevermore be thine, Lord Jesus. Amen. We sing to him. appeared in France in the 1800s as a popular Christmas carol. The text is based off the familiar Luke 2 gospel. This hymn allows us to be a part of the Christmas story. In the first verse, we get to sing from the perspective of the shepherds who proclaim, angels, we have heard on high, sweetly singing to us over the plains, and the mountains in reply are echoing their joyous strains. Then in the second verse, we step back 
and we sing with the narrator, St. Luke. We rhetorically ask the shepherds, why this jubilee, shepherds? Why are you singing such joyous songs? What can it be that inspires you to sing? And in verses 3 and 4, we get the answer. See within a manger lay, Jesus, Lord of heaven and earth. And through all four verses of the hymn in the refrain, we are invited to sing in Latin with the angels the very words they sang over the hills of Bethlehem that first Christmas night. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. We sing the hymn. Christmas without Ludafisk. I would dare to say that it's not a Norwegian Christmas without the singing of Jeg er so glad ver julekvel. This hymn, which I'm sure has been sung countless times in this Rockdale church building, was written by Maria Wexelson, a Norwegian hymn writer from Trondheim. Wexelson began writing poetry and hymns at the age of 20. She was the niece of another Norwegian hymn writer, 
by the name of Wilhelm Wechsels, who wrote the hymn, O Happy Day When We Shall Stand. Wechselson's hymns, which often fall in the category of what we might call folk hymns, were well known throughout Norway, and this Christmas hymn is no exception. The Norwegian immigrants brought it with them when they came to America. It first appeared in English in the Concordia Hymnal in 1932. The translation that appears in our hymnal was done by the Reverend Norman Madsen Sr., who would be Pastor Mike Madsen's grandpa. The hymn is reminiscent of a dance and conveys to us the energy and excitement that children have as they eagerly look forward to Christmas. We adults are encouraged to have the same excitement and joy, knowing that Jesus came down from his exalted throne to save our fallen race. The precious truth of Christmas is that God loves us and never forgets us. Even with all the troubles of life, the seriousness of our everyday grind, as we sing this hymn, we are invited in faith to be like little children again, to glow with joy, contentment, and peace in our hearts, because our Father in heaven has not forgotten us. Through Jesus, he has opened wide his paradise so fair for us. So let anthems fill the air, Sing with merriment, for Christmas is here. We sing verses 1, 2, and 6 of the hymn. for his family's Christmas celebration. He specifically wrote it for his children to learn and sing. The hymn is written sort of like a play, a pageant, with different parts for the family members to sing. The oldest child in the room would pretend to be the Christmas angel and would sing verses 1 through 5. Then the other individual children would take verses 6 through 14 and sing them. Then the whole family would join in on verse 15, praising God together. It was sort of a let's sing the Christmas story together song. No doubt Luther would have accompanied them on his lute, a kind of guitar, as they sang together. Luther wrote the words of this hymn, but not the tune. The tune he borrowed from a common children's garland song of the day called Aus fremden Landen komm ich her. So with Luther and his family we sing. Welcome to earth, thou noble guest, through whom the sinful world is blessed. Thou camest to share our misery. What can we render, Lord, to thee? We sing verses 1 through 3 and 13 through 15. <laughs>
Gerhardt, the author of this hymn, O Jesus Christ, Thy Manger Is, his hymns are shaped by his personal life. While Gerhardt lived, Europe was at war. By the year 1653, when this hymn was first published, Germany was in ruins and was mourning the loss of 20 to 30 percent of its population. In his personal life, there was also tragedy and grief. He had carried three of his children to the grave, and his wife died after only 13 years of marriage. Striving to serve as a faithful Lutheran pastor in the city of Berlin, he also faced great difficulty. He faced a government which expected him to make unacceptable doctrinal compromises. It was Gerhardt who summoned the Lutheran ministers and admonished them to stand firm and to not yield to the demands of the government by compromising the faith. And he himself gave up his pastorate rather than cave in to the demands. Knowing this background helps us to understand Gerhardt's hymns. They are somber and subdued, but they are not filled with despair and sadness. This is because when writing his hymns, Gerhard stood on the eternal and unshakable truths of the Christian faith as found in the Bible. And so again and again, Gerhard's hymns express joy and hope, even in the midst of sadness. Gerhard does not see happiness in the world around him. He does not find comfort in how he feels about things in his life, but he does find comfort and the grace of God revealed in Jesus Christ. The war may be raging, but in the fourth verse he says, How greatly God must love, love thee. The death of his family and friends may have been all around him, but he still says, How greatly God must love thee. He loses his job, but still he confidently sings, How greatly God must love thee. We sing verses 4 and 5 of the hymn. so often sung. <laughs> Besides Silent Night and Away in a Manger, this hymn, written by Charles Wesley, is probably the best known Christmas hymn. It has made its way into our popular culture. It's in the movie It's a Wonderful Life. It appears in a Charlie Brown Christmas. And once you've heard Frank Sinatra's crooning it over the radio, you can't unhear it. So what is this hymn all about? We've sung it and heard it so many times over in our lives, but what does the hymn actually say? Let's look at the words more closely. Verse 1. Hark! That is, listen, pay attention. The angels of heaven are singing glory to the newborn king. 
peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconcile. God has made peace with us through Jesus. He's reconciled himself to us through Jesus. And so we can be joyful with all the nations of the earth. We can sing praises to Jesus, the newborn king. Verse 2 tells us who Jesus is. He is the everlasting Lord, the Son of God, the one who has always existed. And yet here we see him veiled in flesh. That is, we see him born as a human being with a human mother. He is pleased to dwell with us, the children of men. He's called Emmanuel, a Hebrew word that means God with us. Verse 3. Hail to this Prince of Peace, a reference to Isaiah chapter 9. And hail to the Son of Righteousness, who rises with healing in his wings, a reference to Malachi chapter 4. Both of these are prophecies about Jesus from the Old Testament. Verse 4. Come the one whom all people desire. Make your humble home with us in our hearts. Rise, the woman's concrete seed, bruise in us the serpent's head. This is a reference to the promise made by God to Eve, our first human mother, that a son would be born from her womanly line, would bruise the serpent, the devil's head, who would conquer sin and destroy the devil's power over us. Adam's likeness, Lord, efface, that is, scrape off Adam's Jesus, Adam's image, Lord Jesus, and put your image on us instead. Make us to be human beings like you, the perfect human being, rather than Adam, our sinful father. Since you have come as one of us in our humanity, redeem and remake our humanity. Impart all that is yours to us, Jesus. Yes, when we really take a closer look at these words, we see that this hymn has powerful, meaningful, deep theology etched into it. And it is set to a very singable tune. We owe a debt of gratitude to Felix Mendelssohn for this catchy tune, this Christmas hymn that is sung by people far and wide. We sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
child is this, is William Dix. He lived in England from 1837 to 1898. And there he was the manager of an insurance company and the father of a large family. He enjoyed writing poetry. And many of his religious poems, including this one, were later paired with music. A couple other well-known hymns that he wrote included, include Come Unto Me, Ye Weary, and As With Gladness, Men of Old. The tune that this hymn is set to is called Green Sleeves and dates back to 16th century England. It may have been composed by King Henry VIII as a love ballad. This hymn invites us to marvel and wonder at the child in the manger. Who is he? Why is he so humble, lying between animals? We get the resounding answer. This, this is Christ the King. Joy, for Christ is born, the babe, the son of Mary. We sing to him. Christmas Carol. It may be from as early as the 14th century. However, the oldest copy we have of it is from 1760. Had it not been included in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, it may not have become as widely known as it is today. This is because for a time during the 1800s, the carol was actually, unfortunately, performed as a parody of sorts. It was dubbed the old Christmas Carol and was made fun of for its archaic character. But Dickens helped to revive it, whether intentionally or not. 
by having the carolers outside Scrooge's door sing it to him. Who wouldn't sing with the carolers outside Scrooge's door? Why be a Scrooge about such a fun, merry old carol? Sing it, as in days of old. People's attitude changed, and thus the hymn has survived to our modern day. The phrase, God rest you merry, is an archaic English expression that doesn't exactly mean what we probably think it means when we sing it. God rest you merry means God keep you in a state of peace and happiness. God keep you merry. Merry here is not an adjective describing the gentleman. Notice the comma. Rather, it's describing how we hope God will rest, that is, keep you. Why will God cause us to be at and remain at peace and peace this Christmas? Because Jesus was born on Christmas Day. He destroyed the power of the devil. He paid for all sins and has defeated death for us. This causes us to be in a state of perpetual peace and merriment no matter what life throws at us. We sing verses one and two of the hymn. story attached to it. It's an old hymn that has gone through many different languages and translations. In fact, you've probably sung a couple different versions of it in your life. The original author appears to have been Heinrich Zuzo, a German monk who lived in the 14th century. When we think about time frame here, Luther probably would have known and sung this carol. That's how old it is. Legend says that Suzo, on Christmas night, received a vision of angels from heaven who sang to him. He then sat down and wrote down the words the angels were singing, and that their words formed the basis of the hymn. Whether or not this story is true, we just don't know. But regardless, it is a wonderful hymn of praise to Jesus, God's Son. And we do know that the angels praise Jesus. And we also know that when we sing Jesus' praises, the angels join in, singing praises to him with us. And so we sing with angels and rejoice at Jesus the Savior's birth. We sing verse 1.
Good King Wenceslas. You've probably heard this carol sung at Christmas time. You've also probably wondered why it's considered to be a Christmas carol. The text doesn't really seem to have anything to do with Christmas. Oh, and who's this King Wenceslas guy? So first of all, the reason this hymn is often associated with Christmas is because it makes reference to the Feast of Stephen. Saint Stephen, the martyr that we hear about in Acts chapter 7, one of the first believers to be martyred for our Lord. Uh, which his feast is December 26th, the day after Christmas, and hence why it's become associated with Christmas. Stephen was stoned to death for his faith, and the church remembers his life and martyrdom on December 26th and gives thanks to God for his witness to the truth. And who is King Wenceslas? Well, Wenceslas was a Christian ruler of Bohemia, a faithful believer who was well known for his charity, even in the cold of winter time, as the carol indicates and tells us about. He also stood firm and defended the Christian faith against his own mother, who tried to reintroduce paganism to the Bohemian people. In the 1800s, an Englishman by the name of John Mason Neal randomly decided to write a carol about Wenceslas, and that's where we get the carol from, and that's why we sing it at Christmas time. We join together in singing it on the next page. composer of the tomb was born in Philadelphia in 1831. He was a real estate agent, but what he really liked to do was play the organ. He was a real estate organist. Ah. He, served, he served as the organist for the cantor at Holy Trinity Church in Philadelphia, 
where he also served as the Sunday School Superintendent. While serving as superintendent, he famously increased the Sunday School there from 36 children to over 1,000. In preparation for Christmas of 1868, Render decided that there should be a new Christmas hymn. He asked the Reverend Philip Brooks, the main pastor at the church at the time, to write the lyrics to a new hymn for Christmas. And he did, O Little Town of Bethlehem. And as Christmas Eve approached, Pastor Brooks got nervous because Redner had not yet composed the music for his new hymn that Redner had originally asked him to write. Of all the nerves, right? But Redner, being a creative type, never to rush a work of art, showed up to church the next morning when the hymn was set to debut with the tune that we all know and love today. And the rest is history. In the dark streets of the world, Jesus, the everlasting light, was born. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We sing to him. Joyful 
Even in the midst of all of life's problems, he is our true joy. This joy is not just in our hearts. It is a joy that embraces our whole fallen world. Isaac Watts, the English hymn writer, urges us to sing with all of creation our joyful praises to Jesus, the newborn King. We sing verse 1 of Joy to the World. Catholic priest who was serving St. Nicholas Church, Obendorf, in the Austrian Alps. The story goes that the organ at the church went out the morning of Christmas Eve. Not knowing what to do, the priest improvised. He and his organist, Franz Gruber, would write a new hymn quickly so that Gruber could accompany the singing of it with his guitar. It would do. It later became the most famous Christmas hymn. I hope something, one of the things you'll take away from this evening, from learning about these Christmas hymns, is that hymn writers are mere mortals like you and me. They make mistakes. They procrastinate. Their organs break right before Christmas. We're all sinners. Our praises, our cobbled together hymns from different languages, our playing of instruments, our singing, they're all imperfect. Jesus, God's eternal Son, the King of Kings, is surely worthy of something better. But he wouldn't have it any other way. He loves us. He loves it when the little children scream his praises out of tune. He loves it when we're old and warbly, and yet we praise him anyway. After all, remember his humble birth for our sakes. A manger, shepherds as his royal attendants, donkeys and sheep as his royal court. He didn't care. What he did care about was you and me. So great is his love for us poor sinners. May we thank him and praise him forever. We sing a hymn. <laughs>
our service this evening with the tail end of the Vesper's Liturgy, which you can find on page 125. And I invite you to rise as we sing our Lord's Prayer together.
Well, good evening. And thank you all for coming this evening. A happy new year to you all. I pray for God's richest blessings upon you all in the new year. Um, as far as announcements go, I'll, I don't really have any other than service times change on Sunday. So keep that in mind, 8.30 at our Savior's, 10.45 here. And with that, then I'll just say, God rest you married. <laughs> God keep you married and, and in peace. Thank you. 